Welcome to Think Tech on Spectrum OC16, Hawaii's weekly newscast on things that matter to tech and to Hawaii. I'm Cynthia Sinclair. And I'm Keisha King. In our show this time, we'll take a look at our various talk shows covering business in Hawaii. Our business lineup ranges from shows on entrepreneurship, management, investments, loans, exports, computer science, software, and security, law, taxation, and of course, rotary. These shows touch on things outside business too, just as other shows in our lineup often touch on things that do include information useful to business. ThinkTech emerged out of the Building Owners and Managers Association, BOMA, back in the 1990s. That's where we started doing panel programs on business and community issues. We continued in the aught years working on the development of the technology industry and thus the diversification of Hawaii's economy. After all, we have a special blend of business in Hawaii and a business mindset all of our own. It pays to take a look at how that came about, how it's changing, and what we can do to keep up. If we pay attention to these things, Perhaps we'll appreciate them all the more and find ways to improve and enhance our quality of business and business life going forward. So let's take a look at some recent samples of a handful of shows that focus on business in Hawaii, and you can see what we mean. First, there's Law Across the Sea, hosted by Mark Sklob at 1 p.m. every other Monday. However, the government helped us by paying six teachers. Okay. So Six. the government is involved. It's involved. But just for the teachers. Just for the teachers. You the rest, provide the facility. Everything else. Yes. I see. And yes. for the kids. And now Including you a... uh, building two small houses for the teachers to live uh -huh. on the school campus. And, and, and how many grades does this go? Uh, from first grade to sixth grade. And when they finish sixth grade, that's it. Most of them uh, go back to farm in their village. And a few will continue. And starting from 2019, 2020, we came up with the idea of uh, opening a program called Scholarship for Children who are, you know, very good and who would like to continue to the nearest city. And, and we start that this coming year. And so that would be seventh, eighth, seven all is, the way to twelfth grade. Is it the grade. same type of grades uh, we have here? Uh, yes, much. yes. From seventh grade all the way to twelfth grade, we will support them. Uh, for six years so that they can finish the, the entire high school. And then, obviously, the, the ones that came back as teachers, they, they already did. They did. They went, show went us, on, like, yes. And so. they, now, did they have to go to college? or They had to go to the college. It's uh, a teacher in, program. I think it's like 18 or 24 months. Yeah, well, they finished the high school. Then they continue, I believe, in the capital city to be trained as a teacher. And then they decide what they want to do in life. Some of them remain in the city, in the capital city. Some of them uh, go to wherever they want, and then only a few that come back to the rural area. So there is a little bit of a mixed blessing here, right? Because some of them, they will leave yes. their, their home, and that's because of their education, yes. really, isn't it? Yes. I right. mean, they, were, they got a big advantage yes, from actually. the education, and so... They may have to leave their family in order to pursue their, their dreams, their dream, if yeah. you will. Yeah. And we've met a number of our students who have gone on uh, to, the capital city. to the capital city and building a life there. How does yes. it make you feel? Terrific. It feels good. And just, you know, as long as we are able to help uh, give them a chance, why not do it? And as you know, education is the future for the children of any country. Then there's Security Matters, hosted by Andrew Lanning at 10 a.m. on Tuesdays. If you reach out and you email any of us, we will send you a copy, or you can just go online and Google Basic Safeguarding Requirements for Federal Acquisition Regulation. It's right, there's a really nice document, like you said, there's Great guidance workbook. there, and it's Great free, workbook. and get it, and get to work on it, because this is stuff you should be doing really anyway. Yeah, the biggest problem, though, and I'm going to use another word of the day, yeah. uh -oh. as opposed to the plethora of information, yes. there's a dearth <laughs> of effort. A dearth oh. of effort. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> there, there is a lack of, of responsibility being taken by the, the smaller businesses, and mostly because they're like five people running the whole business, and they got to right. do all the work, and then you dump this on them yeah. on the front page of their contract. They're not looking at that. Yeah. It, well, it, they will next year. Next when, year. Oh, we're going to get to that. Okay. Yeah. They will next oh, year. oh, he okay. almost stole my whole episode. Oh, okay. <laughs> there my Slide number two, Can't my show. the episode. Man. <laughs> so, spoiler, spoiler alert. Outside, right, right under the FAR, we've had the DFARS compliance, the right. Defense Federal Acquisition Regulations, which is a smaller subset of the FAR. FAR. 
very particular. I might say a larger subset, really, in some ways. It's far more prescriptive than the Federal Acquisition None Regulations Jeez, basic really safeguarding to guidance. Today. Right. Right. Now we got how many families? It's 14 Dave families. Dave knows. There's 14, 14, knows. Families, 14. Yeah. 14 families here of stuff you need to take care of. Um, let's get to some, some professorial stuff here. <laughs> Walk us through I'm just in over general. This way. <laughs> Walk us through in general these 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 families and sort of what what they're about. Well, it's a combination of two things. It's the old FIPS 200, and mm -hmm. it's the new NIST rules. Uh, some of them taken out from the 853, which is organizing for the the huge government organizations, yeah. right? Yeah. So this is a subset of the controls for non-governmental organizations, but that are vendors of the federal government. And a lot of people don't understand that this is for downstream. So if you're the federal government, I have a contract with you, and Gordon's subbing out to me, we all have to be compliant. We all have to be compliant. And We're all in big trouble. That's, that's hard when, when I'm Speak going to have to get you know, Gordon to sub for me. i got to say, hey, are you 800-171 compliant? If you're not, I can't put you on my contract. RFI. Yeah, there's, yeah. No, there's no contract. Then there's Talking Tax, hosted by Jay Fidel at 1 p.m. every other Tuesday. They're holding a little something themselves, isn't it? I mean, it's not just an error, it's not an oversight. They just, they just want to hold little rainy day money for themselves. Isn't that true? That's what it seems like. I mean, you, you never know what the, the actual motivations are. But um, So, you know, one question is, how much money does the state really have? Yeah. You know, after, after you answer that question, then, then maybe you can kind of get to, well, are, are we spending it properly or are we, are we spending too much? Well, and is it accessible, you know, for the state in general? If it's essentially hidden, Linda Lingle, we talked about this last show. Linda Lingle had an initiative to try to find it. I don't think she ever found it. Uh, maybe some of it, but there's a lot of money out there where if, you, if you're the governor and you say, gee, we need to dig deep. We need to get the special fund money. We need all of it now for a special emergency. Okay, it's not clear what would happen. Not clear that we'd have access to it. Yeah, I mean, it, I'm not even sure the, uh, that the executive departments would cooperate. Yeah. Because... Because, you know, as you, as you know, uh, there are elected officials, right, who are at the titular head of, of government. They issue orders to these departments. Uh, the departments have a lot of civil service people. And a lot of them have the mentality of, oh, well, uh, you're here now, I'm here now. Uh, in four years, you will be gone. And, and I'll, I'll still be, be here. here. I've seen that. I've seen that personally. And extraordinary, you know, it's like, I'm comfortable. doesn't matter what you do, I can outlast you. So I'm not going to listen. Right, so, uh, so that, that's the first P, um, pensions, and around that are, are some very, very serious issues about, you know, kind of counting what we have and where we have it. Yeah. So this, you know, this, this is a problem. Then there's Tourism 101, hosted by former Mayor Mufi Hanneman at Random Times Monthly. Somehow I've always been fixated on doing a rail transit system. Why is it going to be different this time? That we're actually going to cross the goal line in your estimation? Well, I, first of all, I think you all were fixated on it because we have a perfect corridor for, for a, a major rail transit project here on Oahu. Between the mountains and the ocean, where the majority of the population lives, where the majority of the employment is, it's just a natural corridor, and I know it was planned that way over many, many years on Oahu. So it really just made sense that uh, there needed to be this high-capacity uh, transit solution to complement the very fine bus service that we have here. Um, so it, it, it was important to have a champion such as yourself to get that project off the ground and up and running. I think. Uh, you know, one of the things that we've learned when I came back on this project about a year and a half ago, uh, there were many issues in terms of really just, the, as I mentioned, project management, uh, construction. We've learned a lot of lessons uh, from the initial uh, construction aspects of the project in the West. We've taken those lessons forward and we're applying them as we come through the airport area now. And now as we come into the city center area, we're applying a lot of lessons learned uh, uh, and things that, that we should be doing, and we're managing the project, I think, much more effectively now going forward. So I guess what you're saying is that there really is no other option, given uh, the fact that we have a very, um, we have a linear route, 
tailor-made for something like this. We can't really expand towards the ocean uh, or the sea. Then there's Adventures in Small Business, hosted by the U.S. Small Business Administration, the SBA, at 11 a.m. on Thursdays. How did you get into the startup industry? Um, very kind of hard to explain, but I just like, just talk to people. I really had this idea that I really want to connect American and Japanese company all the time, uh, even when I was in Japan. Um, because I used to work in a media company. Uh, also, my father is running business, many business in Kagoshima. So since I was a kid, I'm always getting involved with the business environment. So I've been seeing a lot of interesting business organization people in Japan, but then they're very, very good at making something, doing business, not necessarily active globally. So I want to help them to come to outside. And just always had this idea, so I just like, you know, talk to people about, oh, I really want to do this. I don't want to do that. Um, and then one time, I took internship at the, one of the biggest accelerator in Silicon Valley. Because uh -huh. um, uh, they're they doing, helping a lot of Japanese companies to introduce American startups. I thought it was a great idea to be there to, to kind of learn how to do that. And so I was there, and I'm just talking to people about my idea. Um, I want to make something like connecting Japanese business with uh, American startup in Hawaii. And I just talked to, and then I talked to this one guy, and this guy talked to uh, this Japanese company, it's called Libanus. Mm -hmm. And so they called me, and they just said, hey, why don't you do the events in Hawaii? And we started to plan island innovation every day. So it's like, we, I didn't have any plan how I got involved with it. And just like talk to people and do the events. And through the events, I have to talk with many startups and the organization to actually make the event happen. And I started the business through the event. Then there's Exporting from Hawaii, hosted by Rob Hack at noon every other Thursday. Let's talk about methods of shipping with air freight. Um, we talked a bit about this passenger aircraft. I think that's obvious what that is, all cargo aircraft. I think that's also obvious. Then a freight forwarder, you could, as a freight forwarder, put uh, cargo on either of these. Is that correct? And even on the integrator. So what is an integrator? Can you an integrator that? is one that does not only air freight, the air ships uh, the product, but it also picks up and delivers. So integrators are your UPS uh, and FedEx. And uh, they're an international big company. We use them, believe it or not, to ship container loads. They give us a container rate. Like, for instance, I want somebody going from L.A. to Hilo. Uh, 
They have a flight to go to Kona. While you're talking about this, can we bring up um, slide five, please, is air containers. I think right. probably some people in the, in the audience might not understand that there are different types of uh, air containers and that it depends on the plane, the plane actually, right. and the cargo right. door and the capacity. So maybe you want to explain a bit about this. Right, well, this slide uh, in the middle, upper one, the M1, we ship about two of those a day in from LA. That's our biggest hub coming in. And uh, but the other ones we can go what we call LD containers, lower deck. It goes in the bottom of a passenger plane. The M1s go on a cargo only aircraft, and uh, that would be like the FedEx plane, the UPS plane, or Pacific Air Cargo. They have a, and also uh, Aloha Air Cargo have uh, daily flights uh, coming in from the West Coast. So using these containers, we pay a flat rate, whether we have you know, like an LD3 container, the lower deck, we can put up to 3,500 pounds. That includes the tear, the weight of the container. We can put 3,000 pounds in it, or we can put 1,000 pounds, but we pay a flat rate. So if you have less weight, it's hard for us to get a, a really good price per pound. If we had 3,000 pounds every day, wow, our price per, per pound is less, and we sell it per pound uh, to our customers. Then there's the Cyber Underground, hosted by Dave Stevens at noon every other Thursday. When we do these talks in these rooms, we, we ask how many people use you know, Office 365, and, and by and large, I mean, 90, 99% yep. of the hands come up. So right. so there's your cloud service provider that's handling probably your email, perhaps your file storage. I don't know what else they may be doing for you. But when when you do that, that's where these clause, this G and C clause for DFARS compliance comes from, is out of that cloud service provider right. responsibility. Um, now, those are the shared controls. Yeah, if we can have a slide so, back, it's a good one to, it's a good it's a good, one to it's talk a really about. It's a really good one to but, talk about. The GNC. The GNC, because here's the thing to point out. If, you're a, if you are a uh, contractor doing work for the DOD right now, and you are not Office 365 GCC high, you are already not compliant. Well, if, if you're handling CDI. It, yeah, and this is an assumption. If you're, Again, handling, yeah. if you're handling CDI yeah. or um, controlled, unclassified information, mm -hmm. CUI. CUI, confidential information, mm -hmm. you have to be Office 365 GCC high. Yes. You That's have correct. no choice. I, do, I only know of um, a couple of clients on this island that are doing that better at this level of Office 365. Yep. So if they're saying, well, I'm running Office 365 E2, E1, E5. E5 yeah. Uh, home edition, you are not compliant, and you need to you need to be looking at moving to this now. Well, well let's let's so, back up again. So Office yeah. 365 without GCC, which is government community cloud, right? Um, that is the the regular service you can get, like E5, the enterprise right, level five right. commercial. It is compatible with 800-171. Yes. So if you can be in this new cybersecurity module, yeah. uh, maturity model, you can be level three. But you can't go beyond that because you can't comply with the DFARS C and G, which somewhere in there it actually says if there's a cyber incident and you report it to us, to the DOD, we have the option to come and take your physical hard drives to forensically examine Correct. those. Uh, regular Office 365, you cannot do that cannot. because you're in a shared environment. You're, you're virtualized not. across the right. same machine. Yeah. You could be sharing the same hard drive with multiple people. So you have to move into GCC High, where you have a dedicated virtualized environment. Right. So you're, those hard drives are dedicated to just and, you. And, and, and if you're, up. yeah, and if you're doing CDI or CUI, whatever, you have to be in that space. You have to be in that you space. You cannot, you cannot coast into GCC. Finally, there's Business in Hawaii, hosted by Dalen Yanagita at 2 p.m. on Thursdays. There's a plethora of networking opportunities for um, business folks. Um, BNI. There are other smaller. Um, networking groups. What stood out about Rotary for you? I think the thing that stood out about Rotary was that it, it felt like on top of networking, I was able to really do something that was good for the community. I think a lot of people know that Rotary does a lot of community service. So we are in East Honolulu and we tend to do a lot of service projects that are related to education um, and really helping people out. So to me, if I could network and meet other business professionals while also helping the community, that was really a draw for me. Was Rotary originally supposed to be a business networking group? Um, I think when it was founded, that originally that was the original premise of it. It had been founded by, I want to say it was a group of men in Chicago. 
that decided they wanted to be able to network and do business with each other. And from there, it, it grew. It not, it not only grew nationally, but internationally as well. Now, so the Rotary Club of East Honolulu is just one of many clubs. Mm -hmm. um, but Rotary is actually, as you had just mentioned, international. Tell us a little bit about Rotary International and how, how big does that go? Where, where, where does the scope go? Um, it goes pretty big now. I want to say that there are like 1.1 million Rot Rotarians around the world. So it's, it's grown from, you know, just a small group in Chicago. In Hawaii, we've got, um, you know, a few thousand members, I think. The, the great thing about being a Rotarian is that it gives you access to not just the, the members that you have in your club, but the members that you have throughout the district. So Hawaii is just um, is under one district, District 5000. But being part of the Rotary Club of East Honolulu, I can also go out and you know, meet members from different clubs throughout the islands. I can go to the, you know, go to the mainland, join a meeting that they have. These and other business shows are a significant part of our talk show offerings. And we're always looking for new and exciting shows and guests to keep you current. Those are only a small sampling of the shows we do about business. There are many more. You can take a look at them on our YouTube channel. Each one has a playlist and you can see what our host and guests are saying and what we can learn from them. Want to know more about what they have to say? Check out ThinkTechHawaii.com and our YouTube channels for more of these shows and for the OC16 shows we've done over the years. If you have questions or comments about these or any of our shows, please let us know. And yes, it's okay to share them with your friends and colleagues. Thanks so much for watching our shows and for supporting our efforts at ThinkTech. And now, let's check out our ThinkTech schedule of events going forward. ThinkTech broadcasts its talk shows live on the internet from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. on weekdays. Then we broadcast our earlier shows all night long and on the weekends. And some people listen to them all night long and on the weekends. If you missed a show or if you want to replay or share any of our shows, they're all archived on demand on thinktechhawaii.com and YouTube, and we post all our shows as podcasts on iTunes. Visit thinktechhawaii.com for our weekly calendar and live stream and YouTube links. Or better yet, 
Sign up on our email list and get our daily email advisories. ThinkTech has a high-tech green screen studio at Pioneer Plaza. If you want to see it or be part of our live audience, or if you want to participate in our shows, contact shows at thinktechhawaii.com. If you want to pose a question or make a comment, call 808-374-2014 and help us raise public awareness on ThinkTech. Go ahead, give us a thumbs up on YouTube or send us a tweet at ThinkTechHI. We'd like to know how you feel about the issues and events that affect our lives in these islands and in this country. We want to stay in touch with you, and we'd like you to stay in touch with us. Let's think together. We'll be right back to wrap up this week's edition of ThinkTech, but first, we want to thank our underwriters. Thanks to our ThinkTech underwriters and grantors, the Atherton Family Foundation, Carol Monley and the Friends of ThinkTech, the Center for Microbial Oceanography Research and Education, Collateral Analytics, the Cook Foundation, Dwayne Carisu, the Hawaii Community Foundation, the Hawaii Council of Associations of Apartment Owners, Hawaii Energy, the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, Hawaiian Electric Company, Integrated Security Technologies, Galen Ho of BAE Systems, Kamehameha Schools, MW Group, the Scheidler Family Foundation, the Sydney Stern Memorial Trust, Volo Foundation, Yuriko J. Sugimura. Thanks so much to you all. Okay, Keisha, that wraps up this week's edition of Think Tech. Remember, you can watch Think Tech on Spectrum OC16 several times every week. Can't get enough of it, just like Keisha does. For additional times, check out OC16.tv. For lots more Think Tech videos and for underwriting and sponsorship opportunities on Think Tech, visit thinktechhawaii.com. Be a guest or a host, a producer or an intern, and help us reach and have an impact on Hawaii. Thanks so much for being part of our Think Tech family and for supporting our open discussion of tech, energy, business diversification, and global awareness in Hawaii. And of course, the ongoing search for innovation wherever we can find it. You can watch this show throughout the week and tune in next Sunday evening for our next important Think Tech episode. I'm Cynthia Sinclair. And I'm Keisha King. Aloha, everyone. <laughs>